People have lived beside the banks of the Nile River in Egypt for thousands of years. The early Egyptians relied on the Nile's resources to provide them with everything they needed to live. They shared the river valley with the wild animals. They farmed the land and they prospered for over 2,000 years. From the mud and stone along the Nile River, the ancient Egyptians built an advanced civilization. The Nile was probably the most important part of ancient Egyptian geography. It flowed nearly 4,000 miles from East Africa through Egypt to the Mediterranean Sea. Egypt was mostly a dry desert, but along the Nile, life flourished. Elephants bathed in the water. Crocodiles lay in the sun. To the early Egyptians, the animals were unpredictable and dangerous. These animals that lived in Egypt long ago depended upon the water from the Nile for their survival. The people who settled here also depended upon the Nile. They became farmers. They gathered date figs and other fruits that grew on the riverbank. Traders from the rest of Africa came down the Nile on boats and brought with them exotic goods. Gold, ivory, ebony, incense and furs. It was a land of plenty. The ancient Egyptians divided themselves into two kingdoms along the Nile, the kingdom of Upper Egypt and the kingdom of Lower Egypt. Over 5,000 years ago, in 3,100 BC, a very important event occurred. The people of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt joined together under one ruler whose name was King Menes. This was an important event because it marked the beginning of the great ancient Egyptian civilization. The heads of two monsters crossing each other became a symbol for this first national government, uniting the people of Egypt under the rule of the pharaoh. The word pharaoh was a term used by the Greeks to refer to the ancient Egyptian kings. It comes from the Egyptian word para, which meant great house. The pharaoh was a powerful ruler who was thought to be part god and part man. When a pharaoh died, his son became pharaoh. Pharaoh after pharaoh ruled Egypt for over 2,000 years and the pharaoh's country was called the Empire of the Nile. Every year, Heavy rains at the head of the Nile caused the water level in Egypt to rise and flood the land. These floods turned the desert into a fertile valley. Farmers depended upon the nutrient-rich flood to water their crops. They dug the first irrigation canals to help them move Nile water to their fields. After the floods, when the water level of the Nile began to fall, the irrigation canals were blocked off, storing the water for later use. As a result, they could grow more food. To gauge the flood levels, the early Egyptians used a nilometer. The measurements from the nilometer became part of the basis for a 365-day calendar, like the one we use today. This calendar helped the ancient Egyptians predict when to plant and when to harvest their wheat. They recorded events like the wheat harvest in their art. Along with pictures, the ancient Egyptians used a written language called hieroglyphics, made up of secret symbols. By looking at these pictures and symbols, we can learn a lot about the Egyptian people. You can see from these pictures of women in ancient Egypt that they decorated themselves with dark makeup around their eyes and gold jewelry around their necks. Only the wealthy Egyptians could afford to buy makeup. Both men and women used it because they thought it made them look beautiful. 
The women wore robes made from linen fabric, and the men usually wore skirts. Among the most ancient customs in Egypt was the hennaing of hands. Henna is a plant that leaves a colored mark on the skin. At this modern Egyptian wedding, the bride's hands are decorated with henna to make them beautiful, much like the ancient Egyptians did. From these ancient sculptures of a man and woman, we can see that the early Egyptians believed in marriage. For them, marriage was forever. It was a bond that continued even after death. The Egyptians believed that when they died, their spirits would continue to live. The Ankh became a symbol for the idea of eternal life and was incorporated into the hieroglyphic language as a cross with a loop on top of it. This symbol was one of the few hieroglyphics that could be understood by almost all the common people. You can see what a large role religion played in the lives of the ancient Egyptians. According to the ancient myth of creation, there was first only water and darkness. The sun came to this darkness and the water reflected the light. An island of earth rose up from the water and the first ruler landed on the island in the form of a falcon. Every morning as the sun rose above the Nile, this myth of creation was reenacted. The sun was one of the most important symbols in ancient Egyptian religion because without the sun, there would be no life. The sun god was called Ra. In this picture, the animals and people all bow down in honor of the sun. Crocodiles lay in the sun with their mouths gaping open. The Egyptians thought this posture was aggressive to the sun, and so they associated the crocodile with Set. Set was an evil god who was responsible for storms and bad weather that covered up the sunlight. Because the ancient Egyptians believed that their spirits continued to live after they died, they made great preparations for their afterlife. That's why they built huge pyramids of stone as tombs for the pharaohs to help them on their journey to the afterlife. Some archaeologists think that the pyramids were built as a stairway in which the ruler could rise into the sky after death. They could have also been built as a way for the ancient Egyptians to remember their rulers and their great Egyptian civilization along the Nile. It all started along the banks of the Nile River almost 5,000 years ago. The people joined together and the civilization prospered. But eventually, the power of the Pharaoh weakened. Invaders from many different countries came into Egypt. They took its treasures and destroyed its temples. Some ruins from this time have survived. These ruins tell us the stories of an ancient people and a great Egyptian civilization. Segment two, hieroglyphics. When archeologists began to explore the ruins of temples in ancient Egypt, they discovered strange carvings on the walls. These carvings were part of a written language developed by the Egyptian people over 5,000 years ago. This writing was called hieroglyphics by the Greeks. In Greek, hiero means sacred or holy, and glyph means carving. To the ancient Egyptians, the hieroglyphics were sacred carvings. This is the Great Nile River. In ancient times, many animals could be found along the banks of this river. The Egyptian people used images of these animals to communicate ideas in their hieroglyphic writing. Each of the animals had specific qualities, and the picture of the animal became a symbol for these qualities.
A symbol is a drawing or sign that stands for something else. All of these symbols stand for different words and sounds. Take the buffalo, for example. The African buffalo was known as an aggressive, dangerous animal, so it became a symbol for power. This is how Narmer, an ancient Egyptian king, is depicted on a ceremonial carving. Narmer is shown as a buffalo, crushing the walls of his enemy's city and trampling the enemy under his feet. The ibis used its long curved bill to catch food in the deep mud cracks along the Nile River. Because this long beak looked like a pen, the Egyptians used this bird as a symbol for Thoth, the god of writing and knowledge. Vultures spread their wings to soak up the sun's heat. The open wings of the vulture became a symbol for protection, and the picture of the vulture entered the hieroglyphic language as the word mut, which means mother. There are two main types of hieroglyphics. Like the vulture, some of the hieroglyphics were symbols for words. These hieroglyphics are called logograms. In Greek, logo means word and gram means sign. They were word signs. Other hieroglyphics became symbols for sounds. The lion was a symbol for the sound R. Hieroglyphics like these are called phonograms. In Greek, phono means sound and gram means sign. They were sound signs. The hieroglyphic writing contained both logograms and phonograms. That means some hieroglyphics stood for sounds and others stood for complete words. Painting and carving these pictures on stone took a lot of effort and time. But one great invention made writing much easier and faster, papyrus paper. In the swamps along the Nile River, papyrus plants flourished. Papyrus is a marsh reed with a thick stem and flowers at the top. It grows to about 10 to 15 feet high. Its stalks are filled with air chambers so that it floats and can be used to build canoes, like the ones these men are using. Just like the ancient Egyptians, these men gather papyrus plants. The men make as much noise as they can to scare away hippos and crocodiles that live in the swamp. In ancient Egypt, these reeds were flattened under pressure and woven together to make paper that could be written on. This paper, along with the use of ink, a mixture of soot and water, allowed people to write hieroglyphics much faster. During these ancient times, the meaning of the hieroglyphics were kept secret and were understood only by the scribes. In this way, the scribes kept power and knowledge for an elite few. Since that time, writing has evolved. Some written languages are still based on pictures. Others are based on sound. But they all serve the same purpose as this ancient writing, to communicate ideas. Segment 3, Pyramids of Egypt. To the west of the modern city of Cairo in Egypt is a large rocky plateau that sticks out of the desert sand. This plateau is called Giza. Over 4,000 years ago, large tombs were built here for the Egyptian pharaohs. They are amazing feats of engineering. 
three giant pyramids that rise high above the desert like great mountains of solid stone. Together they are called the Pyramids of Giza, and even in their crumbling state, they are considered a wonder of the ancient world. No records from ancient Egypt have survived that tell what the pyramids looked like when they were first built. It wasn't until about 2,000 years ago, in 37 BC, when the Egyptian civilization was taken over by the Roman Empire, that the recorded history of the pyramids starts. Around this time, a Greek geographer named Strabo set out to solve the mysteries of the Great Pyramids. He discovered a secret entrance into the largest pyramid, which could not be seen unless its exact location was known. Strabo found that this entrance opened up into a small passage that descended 274 feet into a burial chamber dug deep in the solid rock of the plateau. When Strabo discovered the burial chamber, it had already been looted by ancient grave robbers. After Strabo's discovery, the exact location of this secret entrance into the Great Pyramid was lost, and for almost 800 years, no one was able to enter it. Around 813 AD, an Arab named Al-Mamun was determined to find the entrance again and re-explore the inside of the pyramid. He and an army of workers chiseled their way for over 100 feet into the solid rock. Using a battering ramp to move the stones, they found the descending passage. They also stumbled upon another secret passage that sloped upward into a second great chamber. Mamun followed this passage which led further up to a third chamber called the King's Chamber. They used torches to light their way through the dark passage. There wasn't much air for them to breathe and large bats swarmed past them as they climbed up and up into the heart of the Great Pyramid. Here they found a chamber with a magical geometry. Not only was it made with perfectly fitted stones, but it was located precisely in the center of the pyramid. That means that the portion of the pyramid above the chamber is exactly one half the size of the entire pyramid. Small holes lead from the chamber to the outside. These holes are like telescopes pointed directly at the stars. Over the thousands of years since their construction, their pyramids have all been looted. Even the smooth stone which once covered the outside surface was stripped and used to rebuild the city of Cairo. Today, most archaeologists agree that the pyramids of Giza were built as tombs for three different kings. The largest of the three was built for King Khufu. The second great pyramid was built for King Khafre, and the third was built for King Menkore. Standing near the pyramids of Giza is the Sphinx. This Sphinx has the body of a lion and the face of Khafre himself. The word pyramid comes from the Greek word pyramis, which means wheat cake. The Greeks made small cakes which were the same shape as the Egyptian tombs, and so that's what they called the tombs when they saw them. One reason the Egyptian pyramids seem so mysterious is because it's hard to imagine how the ancient Egyptians could have built them without cranes or tractors or any modern engineering equipment. Digging the burial chamber into the stone floor was the first step in building a pyramid. When the hole for the burial chamber was finished, the huge stone blocks were moved to the site. They were cut from stone cliffs along the Nile River and transported by boat to the Giza Plateau. There they were raised and fitted perfectly into their proper places.
The largest of the three pyramids is made of more than two million stone blocks that weigh about two and a half tons each. That means that each of these stone blocks weighs more than the average car. That's a lot of stone. No one knows exactly how the ancient Egyptians moved the stone blocks into the shape of a pyramid. Most archaeologists think the ancient Egyptians may have used giant ramps to raise the stones to their proper level. We do know that a pyramid is formed with a square base and four triangular sides angled into the center. The top of each pyramid is the exact center of the square base. The largest pyramid of Giza is 484 feet high and each side of its square base is about 755 feet long. Because of this height and base length, each triangular side has an angle of 51 degrees. That's a much steeper slope than the average staircase. What's more amazing is that each of the four sides of the pyramids are set precisely on the points of the compass. Each side faces north, south, east, or west. The ancient Egyptians had no compass, so they must have used the stars and the sun to find the compass points. Today, the city of Cairo spans to the edge of the desert, where the pyramids of Giza loom on the horizon. To the people of Cairo, the pyramids are a constant reminder of an ancient time.